so they say that the blood flowed down that temple and down the causeways just into the lake it was just crazy how much uh how much human sacrifice happened that day a little something real quick on the technology of the actual sacrifice they drugged them you know how when we go into surgery we get numbed or we get knocked out or we get you know anesthesia well they were likewise anesthetized so they didn't feel pain and they didn't feel fear in fact they were not only anesthetized but they were kind of given some other drug to pump them up so that it would be glorious so then they plunged the obsidian knife into the heart only of the men priests would pull out the palpitating heart and offer it to the son god the father son keep him happy keep him going because they understood that death gives new life. So the Christian message of Jesus's death brings new life is very familiar to the mindset and to the to the cosmology of the Aztecs. They understood that death was required for new life. So for example, the seed, when you plant it, it has to die. It has to split open and dry up before new life can emerge. So they, and then, and then when we die, our bodies decompose and, and, and feed the earth. And for them, that moment was the embrace of the mother earth. Mother earth took you back, took you back into her body, and then you would be reborn. So she would take in the, the newly dead. The blood would be driven out of her mouth to her womb. So your blood would feed her womb, and then she would give new life. So it wasn't just a strict power macho, hey, I'm a patriarch and I'm just going to kill you. Mm. It was for them the idea that, um, that that this is our offering. This is our sacred ritual. When the, the Spaniards Christianized the Aztec peoples, they got that whole thing of the transfiguration of the body of Christ and the blood of Christ and the, the wine and the host and made sense to them. I think it's so interesting how different cultures interpret things in different ways you know and i think it just shows how and maybe that's how history repeats it or parts of history repeat themselves like that you know or, or even ideas in history even like in the bible of leviticus it's all about sacrifice and it's all about killing something to sacrifice to this higher being and yeah, it's just so interesting how that kind of be and translates in different cultures cultures yeah so it's even, it's even like in our modern culture we go for the long term right so we sacrifice the moment right now so that in the future we can have I guess, more freedom or more opportunities dying right now so that in the future there could be more life. Psychological death, yeah. Well, no, no, even physical. That's what we tell our soldiers. You, you, our military personnel are told, you need to, you need to be ready to give your life for your, for your country or for your homeland or your loved ones or something. So it certainly is a notion that has an enormous, as, as Steele said, recurrence in history and all the way up to the present day. Dr. Teresa Van Hoy, a professor of history at St. Mary's University in San Antonio. Um, she got her PhD at the University of Texas at Austin. She also published a book called Peons, Prisoners, and Priests, A Social History of Mexico's Railroads. And she's also working on a current book project called Cinco de Mayo and the Civil War in the Borderlands. So I want you to imagine that moment when you are the last Tlatuani emperor of the Aztecs. Your name is Cuauhtémoc. So he gave the speech on the 12th. Spaniards catch him and they're so happy because they're looking for the rest of the, the treasure of the Aztecs. And so they're angry and they hold his feet to the fire and they torture him. And they say, where is the gold and silver? And he says, the treasure of the Aztecs is in the smile of their children. Where? You know, so they, they, they torture him worse and worse. And of course he never... He never tells. So Mexican people still looking for that, that treasure. Wow. Is there uh, ideas that there might be a treasure? There are ideas. Yes, there are ideas. They, it was like in a fairy tale. Well, so first Moctezuma, the Tlatuani, the, the, what we call emperor of the Aztecs at the time of Hernan Cortes's arrival, he hosts them. He gives them a palace near his. So a little while, a week or so later, they say, well, hold on now. Uh, won't you come over here and live in our palace? Or, or, or why don't we go over there and live in your palace? Because they're getting nervous. They end up living in the same palace. And then in no time, they capture him. Fill this room with silver and gold if you want us to release him. And sure enough, they do. Aztecs fill it with silver and gold. And nope, they don't release him. The enemy of your enemy is never your friend. Because what happens is the enemy of your enemy destroys your enemy and then turns on you. So the real message in this history is fix your problems and stand together because if finding what you think is a stronger enemy to help you out is going to set you free from your enemy, 
like, Shh, nope, you're going down with your enemy. Better be friends with your enemy. Cause yeah. Otherwise, you're going down too. Let me just speak to what I regard as the greatest achievement, technological achievement of the Aztecs. So what they did was figure out how to convert swampy marshes, marshland, very shallow lake areas, the valley of Mexico, into basically high yield hydroponic farms. Mm -hmm. So what they did was build huge baskets, baskets as big as a city block in Manhattan. And then they start scooping up the muck, the watery soil, and dumping it into the basket. So think of three huge baskets, each the size of the city block. And then you build, you dig a canal between them. Then you plant trees whose roots can go through water and anchor that basket into the subsoil beneath. So now the bank, the basket's not floating around in this little canal. Now, instead of a field where you farm, it becomes a lake where you farm filled with floating islands the size of a city block. It's extremely high yield because it's very rich soil, very well watered. You don't have to irrigate. You don't have to worry about whether it's going to dry out. And even today, 500 years later, you too can... Take a plane down to Mexico City, take an Uber over to a place called Xochimilco. You can hop out on one of these islands and you can jump up and down and the land undulates. The <laughs> land gently, like in a basket, it gently undulates. And so it's kind of extraordinary to defy. You're looking around at trees, you're looking around at cornfields, and yet, you know, the earth, the earth dances. I think that it just goes to show how how smart the civilization civilization was in using their resources. It was uh, improving the way of agriculture. It helped them have more time for other things, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, so they didn't have to irrigate them and, and have to worry about how they were going to water the plant. So that saves time and it produces more. Then they just have to make sure that everything's main, maintained and then they could go and do other things and not worry about like, it receiving enough water or anything like that. So, and on the other side is Popocatépetl, who is the warrior prince who guards her. So he's cruising in between the two of them, and suddenly below, they behold the paradise. This beautiful city, sparkling clean, plumbing, drainage, all of the amenities that we take for granted now, five hundred years later. But it certainly wasn't the norm for Europe, 1519. Rome, Vienna, Madrid, in the 1400s, you're basically dodging feces when you're trying to walk. They're, if you're lucky that the, the, the streets are paved with cobblestones, but they're paved in kind of a V-shape so that the maid can throw out the urine and feces from the night into the streets and they roll down. But Europe at the time had so many diseases, black plague. Europe's population kept suffering famines and wars and it just couldn't, they couldn't grow. So here they are in this city with its wonderful drainage, with its wonderful plumbing and indoors. You're talking about technology. They built long, long roadbeds over the lake. Uh, in Europe, you may remember that usually the next king was the eldest son of the dead king. The Aztecs figured out, do you don't actually know if that's your son, right? Because your queen might have had another lover, right? So they didn't have DNA testing back then. So the Aztecs realized, okay, so it's not going to be the son who inherits because we don't know whose child that is. And it's not only the firstborn son because he might be pretty lousy specimen. So how does that solve their problems? Well, if Jose and I were born from the same womb, if we're brother and sister, we know we're blood kin, right? We have the same mother. If Jose is Tlatuani and he wants a successor that he knows is his blood kin, then he knows that anybody who comes out of my womb is his blood kin, right? Because I'm his mm. sister. Jose starts looking at my sons. Mm. And fortunately, I had 20 or something. <laughs> and he and you had probably 20 sisters so uh, there's a big pool of candidates right there all the sisters that came out of the same one as you plus all of their sons <clears throat> become the, the pool for the next to, to to choose the next king well instantly it's obvious to everybody that steel is the most talented of all those of all the, of all jose's nephews so he becomes he, he is named the next Tlatuani, the next king Steel is not confirmed in his role until he can prove one thing. Just like in the old Knights of the Round Table where you had to go out and prove your worth. He has to, he has one job. 
and that is to entirely build his temple on top of Pulsus' temple. If you cut a cross section down through the middle of the ancient Aztec main temple, you'll find seven littler temples underneath. Wow. Right? So the first one for the first, and then the second one, and then the third one, the fourth one, the fifth one, and then steals, you know, it's like, Argh. and remember, they don't have, they don't have beasts of burden. So there's no mules or donkeys or horses to help roll these stones. They have to, they have to put sand down. Uh, they have to put, lay a rock causeway and put sand down to limit the drag, to limit the friction and drag steals big, big boulders up. And they don't have mortar. They don't have steel of any kind. They don't have metal or iron. So how does, how does steel carve his decorations into, you know, into his stone, make his fancier? How does he get those um, feathered serpent heads? Well, that's looking for an even harder stone, which in their case was a black volcanic glass called obsidian. So they would sharpen obsidian and use that to carve those decorations in Steele's temple. So it was really quite an extraordinary achievement. And then he had to do one last thing. He had to inaugurate it. Steele is going to need the favor of the sun god, a father god, the father sun, and the mother earth. You've got to curry their favor in order for your people to have agriculture. Now he's got to organize a bunch of battles and they're called flower wars where they basically the whole point is to capture warriors so that you can sacrifice them. You know, they had universal education. You were asking like, how do they get these ideas? Education. Yeah. Edu in, in the Aztec world, every child got an education, girls and boys. And that's why they were more advanced than other cultures, you know, because they not only had their agricultural stuff together and were kind of had that solved, so they didn't have to worry about that thing. But they also had education that kind of everyone was educated. Mm -hmm. So it's like, yeah, the more people you educate, the higher chances you are going to have innovation. So, mm -hmm. and, and was was the education geared more towards agriculture, or was it also like management? To kind well, of well, their education was everything. Their education was religious. Their education was practical home matters and city building and civic management, agriculture also. And they learned poetry and they learned um, arts. Absolutely. Carving of obsidian and carving of jade. They learned uh, many, many things. It was a rich, it was rich education.